NFL Network presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number 15. In 1971, Disney World opened its doors in Orlando. All in the Family made its television debut. And in the same year Phyllis George won Miss America, Mr. Cowboy was celebrating his 10th year with the team. Bob Lilly was Dallas's first ever draft pick, and he had seen the franchise grow from laughingstock into legitimate contender. 1965 was the first year that we, we broke out of the, the losing column. We were picked, I think, to win the Eastern Division. We ended up 7-7, seven and seven, which was a pretty good step for us. In 1966, we did think we'd be in the hunt and ended up playing Green Bay in the Cotton Bowl for the opportunity to go to the first Super Bowl. Coming up one yard short against Green Bay, was the first in a series of bitter disappointments. The following year, Dallas lost the Ice Bowl and lost their second straight championship game to the Packers. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback. He's into the touchdown. The Packers are out in front. And the Green Bay Packers are going to be world champion, NFL champion. In both the 1968 and the 1969 playoffs, they were eliminated by the Cleveland Browns. The Cowboys were accumulating big game losses and unwanted labels. We were called the bridesmaids of the NFL, but we had a lot of tags. Can't win the big one. You know, next year's champions. By that time, we, we had started believing uh, a little bit that we couldn't win the big one. It sort of started being a part of us to lose a big game, to get to it and lose it. In 1970, Dallas lost in Super Bowl V a game described by one journalist as a series of freak plays, all of which went against the Cowboys. In that game, Bob Lilly was a veteran defensive tackle, Roger Starback was a backup quarterback, and Dwayne Thomas was a rookie running back who made a critical rookie mistake. Wayne Thomas fumbled that football, and the Baltimore Colts recovers. Dave Manders kind of recovered, but Billy Ray Smith was screaming their ball is, is kind of that's the story <laughs> and uh, they gave the ball to the Colts and we score there and I think the game's put away but we didn't. It was a horrible loss because we, we really I think we're a better football team that day. The kick is up and it's long enough in it. As soon as he kicked the field goal, I threw my helmet 50 yards, which I'm ashamed of, but I did. And a Baltimore Colt rookie, and I don't know his name, brought my helmet back over to me and said, here's your helmet, Mr. Lilly. And I said, thank you, son. And I've kind of felt bad, you know, I felt not that tall. The grim tally for the Cowboys was this. Five straight years of playoff football, zero championships. You know, it's kind of weird in life, you know, you, you win, 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 but you, if you don't win, the, you know, in football, the Super Bowl, then your season is a failure, which isn't, isn't totally fair, but that's life. 
it was still Dallas cannot win the big game type mentality. So uh, even though we had taken a step closer, it still was, we, we still had that tag of Dallas can't win the big game. Do you miss the old days? I miss, I miss football a great deal, yes I do. What do you miss about it? Do you miss the roar of the crowds? Well, not the roar of the crowd, just, uh, just the competition and uh, using, uh, I guess, uh, God-given ability, really. Uh, I, I just miss uh, being a part of football, but I, I do enjoy the Navy, and I, uh, I have a big job over here, and I'm going to do that, and uh, that's the most important thing right now. Roger Starbuck was drafted by Dallas in 1964 when he was a junior at the Naval Academy. The Cowboys retained his rights during his four years in the service, which included a tour of duty in Vietnam. On his two-week summer leaves, Starback would often practice with the Cowboys and dazzled them with his uncanny scrambling ability. He began his career as a backup to Craig Morton. But by the summer of 71, Roger Starback was given a chance to win the starting job. Having two competent quarterbacks should have been a luxury, but head coach Tom Landry turned it into a controversy. This was a real battle, one-on-one -on -one battle. We were actually fighting for the number one job. Coach uh, couldn't make a decision. He basically said, hey, we have two quarterbacks. If he, if he was running a business, uh, trying to pick a CEO, uh, you don't have two CEOs, and, and that was really a mistake. In 1971, Dallas was the overwhelming favorite to win the Super Bowl. It was supposed to be their year. But the quarterback battle suddenly became a mere sideshow when one player turned summer camp into a circus. You have guys on the team that they would have played for anything. Well, I wouldn't have played for anything. The previous year, running back Dwayne Thomas, number 33, averaged over five yards a carry and won the NFL Rookie of the Year. Now, in his second year, Thomas went to team president Tech Schramm and asked for a new contract. For Rookie of the Year of the NFL, like, you know what I got? $5,000. This player named Don Parrish was a, a friend of mine. You know what Don Parrish got just for Rookie of the Year on his team? $25,000. He received what my whole salary was just for Rookie of the Year on his team. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's not, oh, no, he didn't do that. Uh, Tex, I saw the check stub. The Cowboys knew I need money. I mean, my Rookie Year, I was broke. When the Cowboys refused to renegotiate, Thomas staged a holdout and then lashed out in the media. They interviewed Dwayne, and in the paper, it's uh, we were reading it, and I don't remember the whole article. I just remember he called Tex liar and a cheat and a hypocrite. Tex said, well, he got two out of three right, and he called Coach Landry plastic man, which none of us knew what that meant. I still don't know what it means. <laughs> What was going on with Dwayne was, I, I didn't really understand it. I mean, he, um, there was, there was the, the beginning of, uh, of some reluctance to do a few things, and uh, they, they traded him. On July 31st, the Cowboys traded their best running back to New England. The first order of business for Patriots head coach John Mazur was to ask Thomas to line up in an I formation. Number 33 was accustomed to an upright position. Mazur preferred a three-point stance. So I'm in an up position in the I formation. And Mazur just yells out, get down! I look over to the side. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Get... I thought he was talking to someone else. I couldn't believe he was telling me to get down in the I formation. Jim Nance, big Jim Nance, is the fullback. Jim Nance's butt is about yay big, okay? Okay, it's like hiding behind a building. So he's telling me to get down in an eye formation and sticking my head right behind Jim Nance's ass. I said, oh, no, 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 no. So I said, Coach, well, do you know 
the theory and the philosophy of an eye formation? Get off the field. I said, fine. Yeah, I proceeded off the field. The Patriots petitioned Commissioner Pete Rozelle to reverse the trade. In an unprecedented decision, Rozelle dissolved the deal, citing moral and ethical reasons. Five days after he was traded, Dwayne Thomas was returned to the Cowboys. I thought they cut him. Or, you know, I didn't know he was traded. And then he came back, and then I found out later, many years later, that he'd actually gone to another team and spent a few days and, and come back to the Cowboys. The NFL's most buttoned-down, business-like franchise suddenly had a season-long soap opera on their hands. The Cowboys welcomed him back to the roster, but Dwayne Thomas never allowed himself to be part of the team. Boy, people knew how treacherous these people were and what extent they would go to. And yet instead, come right in front of the public and say, you know, we really love having Dwayne here, and we're doing all that we can within our powers to screw him in his ass, okay? When the 1971 regular season began, the drama of summer camp seemed far behind. And in the first two weeks, the quarterback dilemma was resolving itself. An injury to Roger Starback early in the second game meant Craig Morton took most of the snaps. He beat him by three steps, and Craig Morton threw as well on that one as he ever thrown in his life. But in week three, the Cowboys hold on first place and Morton's grip on the starting job both slipped away. Craig started the third game in Dallas against the Redskins. We didn't beat the Redskins, so then I started the next week. So it was, it was a very confusing quarterback situation. Things got more confusing in that Monday night game against the Giants. Back to throw, Roger down the middle, cut! Starback gave the Cowboys a 13-6 lead, but Tom Lamprey benched him at halftime. So now I'm thinking, hey, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't been shooting straight with me that, you know, here, here we are winning a game and to be taken out. It, I mean, it couldn't have been anything worse in my mind. That was a horrible moment for me. I mean, I, I never felt so bad. Horse back to throw. Bob throws a bomb. Way down for Hayes. Bobby's got it. Bob Hayes. The Cowboys beat the Giants, but lost three games in five weeks. And Tom Landry began using his quarterbacks like a baseball manager uses his bullpen. In the first half of the season, the offense had no rhythm because the team had no leader. I think that was the downer at the start of the season. There wasn't a leader at quarterback. There was, there was two of us, and it, it, it divided the team. I, I did not like an alternating quarterback. I, I know there must have been a reason that Coach Landry had, but as players don't like that. We like to have somebody over there. If he's not going to cut it, put somebody else in, but let us have somebody to lead us. I had a lot of admiration for Craig Morton, and, you know, but I was in a tough situation. I was 20, 29 years old at the time, and if I'm, I knew I could be a starting quarterback in the NFL. Well, I told Coach Landry, you know, if you don't have the confidence in me, I need to, you need to think about having me go somewhere else. With the quarterback carousel in full spin, the Cowboys added to the carnival atmosphere of the 71 season by staging a mid-season move. Dallas bid farewell to the Cotton Bowl, where they had enjoyed one of the best home field advantages in the league and ushered in the NFL's most luxurious and modern facility, Texas Stadium. But it wasn't a popular decision. I didn't look at Texas Stadium as being a big thing. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed the Cotton Bowl better. They probably didn't want to air condition it, uh, so they had the hole in the roof. I mean, there was reasons they gave for the hole in the roof, so God could watch his son coach. It was a more sterile atmosphere. I mean, it was like there just wasn't a lot of shouting and noise. And it was interesting how the crowd responded after a, a touchdown of a play. It was like, bravo, bravo. Yeah. 
And, 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 and that was the extent of it. It was the NFL's version of the Taj Mahal, a huge revenue producer for an already wealthy team. Yet the Cowboys still managed to underpay their players. Jeff Thorpe was making 16-5. He had, he had already, he was four years all pro. And I said, well, um, I wonder if this just a, you know, racial thing, just a black thing. I said, let me find what the white boys are doing. So I talked to Bob, and then Bob said, he's making $27,000. I said, 27000 That's it? But the 11 Pro Bowls I went to, about the last eight of them, we always talked about salary. When I negotiated with Tex, and I told him, some of these defensive linemen I met are making 100 And he said, don't you know they're just pulling your leg? He said, they're just trying to make you angry at us. And, you know, I didn't know whether to believe him or not. For years, the Cowboys' strategy was to underpay big names like Lilly and Starback, and then tell the rest of the team they couldn't make more than the stars. I said, oh, this is not a racial thing. This is a greed and power thing. This is playing us against one another. I didn't have an agent, and you know, I, I'm not saying that's good. I probably wish I would have had an agent, someone that could have got between myself and Tex. Tex was a willing dealer, uh, but to me, it was someone that you really couldn't trust. Yeah, yeah, you really couldn't trust. Tex's job was not to earn the player's trust. His job was to make money for his owner and build a winner. In week six, he also threw a Texas-sized debutante ball for the new stadium, and former President Lyndon Baines Johnson was on the guest list. The game turned into a coming-out party for Bob Lilly and the Cowboys, who seemed revitalized after their slow start. The 44-21 victory over New England gave the Cowboys a 4-2 and two record, and for the first time all season, Roger Starback played every meaningful minute of a game. So now we, we're really in a, I mean, there's everybody's picking sides, you know. Someone, some people on Roger, some people on Craig. You know, that game definitely got some people on my side. I really thought maybe I was in the lead. It was now week seven of a 14-game schedule, and the Cowboys still didn't have a number one signal caller. In an effort to resolve the two-headed quarterback situation, Coach Landry made a head-scratching decision. We're in the team meeting, and Coach Landry announces we're going to have two starting quarterbacks against the Bears, I'm going to alternate plays. And, you know, Craig and I kind of looked at each other and said, you know, I just hear, who, who was that? You know, I, mean, I hate the question. <laughs> Coach Landry is, you know, again, he's not perfect. He's a little quirky at times. <laughs> and, and that didn't make any sense. That, that just showed the fact that he still hadn't understood that, that the team was a bit divided at quarterback. We were getting a lot of penalties because of delay of game. Because the quarterback come in, they'd be shouting on the sideline. He'd look over. It just wasn't... Uh, it was, it, was, it was distracting. I mean, it was very distracting for everybody. We were beyond the sidelines. we get to play, and it's like two ships passing the night. we just go, you know, I'd run out the field. Craig's run off the field, and sometimes we'd probably high-five each other. It was, it, was, it was not one of Coach Lander's great moments. The quarterback experiment failed, or as Sports Illustrated put it that week, the operation was a success, but the patient died. The Cowboys outgained the Bears, but lost 23 to 19, and were now in danger of missing the playoffs. The, the circumstances after we lost the Chicago Bears, we were four and three, and we we were not uh, we were not a healthy four and three. The Redskins were six and one; they were on a roll. Unnamed players were saying things in the paper. If you would have been in that atmosphere, you would have bet whatever you could that the Dallas Cowboys had no shot at the rest of the season. The decision to alternate quarterbacks was a mirror into Landry's coaching soul. To him, football was a game of positions, not a game of people. Uh, he was a player, and he was a very, very bright guy who knew an awful lot about football. But he was not a, a psychiatrist, and he wasn't a real strong motivator. It was like a business 
You receive your information. There was no pep talks or anything of that. Knock them down now, okay? Knock your outside men down. Knock your outside men down. Sometimes coach tried to overthink uh, football. In training camp, we were out scrimmaging the 49ers, um, and you know, Coach Landry's over there explaining to me, watch the strong safety. If he's going strong, you know, it's going to be a 31. He walked away, and Brody's there kind of sitting there. He could hear what it, and he said, what, what is he talking about? I said, well, those are the keys we have to read. He said, ah, that's a bunch of bull****. Just go get back there and throw the football. <laughs> he said, I don't know how you could put up with that. It was once said of Tom Landry that he had a computer where his heart should be. But his players knew better. They understood Landry was a byproduct of his era and his life experiences. We could tell he really cared about us. You know, I mean, he didn't show emotion a lot, and I'm sure that went back to the war when he was flying and had 30 missions himself. Had people all around him dying in airplanes, and he actually had a crash or two himself. His brother was killed, too. I think when you're 19, 20, 21, it's got to be uh, very dramatic, because I know I have kin folks that fought, and they were about his age, and they were in the Marines, and they were in the Navy, and they lost a lot of comrades, and they don't even talk about it. And they're pretty, they don't, you know, it's like my dad never said, I love you. But he, he always put his arm around me and he loved me, but it was like, it was sort of unsaid. So that may be part of it. The quarterback controversy was affecting every aspect of the team. The defense decided it was time to approach Coach Landry, but there were no volunteers. We voted Leroy Jordan the uh, opportunity to present our feelings to Coach Landry, that we wanted one quarterback, one leader, either one, just give us a quarterback. On the brink of a lost year, Tom Landry listened to his players and made the decision that launched an American hero and saved the Super Bowl season. We'll go with Staubach uh, as our quarterback. I think if it's Rogers' time to make his move, if he's going to make it. I feel I'm confident he can do it, or else I wouldn't have picked him. When he announced I was a starting quarterback, it changed my life. That was a kind of a whole new season starting, and we had a team meeting, too, and it was a great team meeting. Real emotional, and where players got up and really were hot. Hey, this season isn't over. We still have seven games to go, and... If they get in the goal line, it's over somebody's dead body. Otherwise, they don't get in there. We weren't giving it all we had. And from that point on, we did. With a 4-3 and three record, the Dallas Cowboys faced a critical division showdown with St. Louis. The game was also notable for the matchup of two future Hall of Famers, defensive tackle Bob Lilly and Cardinals rookie guard Dan Deerdorf. Larry Cole, uh, my teammate, thought that he had played against Deerdorf in college. And so he told me all week, he said, no, nah, don't worry about him, he's just a fat guy. He won't be able to block you. And so whenever they came out, I was looking down there to see what he looked like, and he didn't look like a little fat boy to me. He looked like a big, strong guy. And I said, Larry, are you sure that's a guy? And he, I, he said, where is he? I said, he's right down there. And he said, I didn't look like the guy I played against. <laughs> but I think I, I taught him a few lessons after that. Despite his initial apprehension, Lilly overpowered Deerdorf in a classic veteran mismatch, and the defense held St. Louis to one touchdown. In a game they could not afford to lose, Dallas trailed 10-3 at halftime. But Landry showed faith in Starback, and that faith was rewarded. I knew when he said I was a starting quarterback that he, I wouldn't be pulled. I mean, it was a whole different feeling. When he announced that I was a starting quarterback, he was going to stick with me. This was my season now. This was my team. Starback's brilliant second half was the Cowboys' first step on the road to the Super Bowl. Rolling back to Starback, looking, firing down the middle, touchdown for Dallas to Ditka. Late in the fourth quarter with the score tied, Dallas knew their season was at stake. 
the legs of Dwayne Thomas and the arm of Roger Starback got the Cowboys in field goal range. But it was a foot that decided the game. And we had a new kicker named Tony Fritz. He was a kicker they found on a kicking caravan in Austria. He, he was a soccer player and a mechanic. He, he worked for Mercedes. Tony was funny as he could be, but he didn't understand a word that year. I mean, nothing. We finally got down to the last part of the game. Larry Stallings of the Cardinals said, uh, hey, Fritz, you can't kick the ball. You don't know how to kick the ball. You're not from here. You've never kicked in a game. And we were all laughing about it. We all said, save your breath, buddy. He can't understand a word you're saying. And that, we all cracked up. And now we're going to see Air Fritz, the Austrian. Snap, kick is up. This one is good. The Cowboys lead 16 to 13. We believed in ourselves more than we'd ever done uh, at any time during that season. And uh, we, got, we got on a roll. The Cowboys never lost another game that season. Secure in his role as starter, Roger Starback now looked over his shoulder at defenders, not at Tom Landry. Starback was the NFL's top-rated passer. The longest pass play of the year for Roger Starback, 51 yards. Dwayne Thomas led the league in touchdowns. He picks it off to Thomas, one-handed catch. Most of the games that we've won, we knew we were going to win. You know, and, that, and, and that's a great feeling. You know, where you know, you know that you know that you know. The Cowboys always knew they were good. In the second half of the 71 season, they found out they were great. Dallas won their final six games of the regular season by an average of 20 points. Their anchor was Bob Lilly, number 74, a man who never missed a regular season game in 14 professional seasons. You know, I don't know any other player where we were watching film in his own teammates, but it would be ooing and aahing with his quickness and his strength. He was something special. I mean, he was the very best defensive lineman in the National Football League. If they scored, they were going to have to crawl over dead bodies. That's how we felt. That may be the ingredient we lacked some of those prior years. We were just mentally there. We finally had arrived. We were in a, a real tough mental state. Dwayne Thomas's mental state was always a topic of conversation that season. He never felt part of the team, but he was always a big part of the game plan. Dwayne Thomas gave everything he had. He blocked hard, he ran hard, he played hard, and he was very smart. Dwayne rarely made a mistake. I got the opportunity to play uh, five or six years against Jim Brown, and I just had visions of Jim Brown coming back to life, you know, because Dwayne, he had those same moves, the ones, you know, you, you think you have him and he just wiggles out of it or he gives you a limp leg. He could really go off tackle, about as good as I ever saw, and start kneading his way through the linebackers in the secondary, just almost like music. In fact, I can see it right now. Some players do their talking on the field. Dwayne Thomas didn't talk at all. After he returned that summer from his five-day trade to New England, Thomas decided not to talk to the media or his teammates. He uh, made a decision not to speak to anybody. I mean, one, one guy asked him how he was feeling. He said, are you a doctor? I mean, these are the, these were what he replied to us when we asked him questions. So personally, I just always, every day, made it a point to say, hi, Dwayne. How do we, how are you? Good to see you. Something like that. Just that's what I did. And so and every once in a while he'd just have a little smile, and that was it. Never said a word. And I do know that Dwayne, when he came off the field, everybody would pat him on the back and tell him great run. And that was it. I don't recall that he ever acknowledged it. I think he just sat down, put his head down, and that was it until he had to go back out. 
he kind of got away with some things that you know you would think that coach Landry but he he didn't he really didn't break the rules I mean he wasn't he didn't he, he didn't come late to meetings he uh, wasn't late to practice I didn't come in with attitude of disruption however when I exposed my true personality it was disruptive to other personalities on the team but it was not disrupted to the performance of the team. One cowboy in particular bore the brunt of Thomas's peculiar personality. Backup running back Dan Reeves shared a position with Thomas, but rarely shared a civil moment. Dan was a player coach at that particular point in time, and so he was calling row. Now, we down to the regular team here. And you know, he opens his roll book up, you know, uh, Jethro, uh, Pugh, uh, Bob Lilly, um, Tom Stensick. And he goes on and on, and then he gets to Dwayne. 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 Well, don't you see me? And he just kept going over and over, you know, you know, like some nincompoop. And I'm sitting up there, I mean, how dumb can you be? Jordan here, Pew here, and so forth. And he would just, he might go, hmm, or something. A little bit of rebellion there, I know, but we'd always look at him and shake our head. But I tell you, get him on the football field. With an 11-3 record, the Dallas Cowboys made the postseason for the seventh straight year. Since 1965, Dallas had experienced paradise in the regular season, but pure hell in the playoffs. This year was different. Being on a roll that we were, we were now a new team. We were so determined that I, I just, uh, looking back on it, um, we were going to beat the Vikings in Minnesota. In the divisional playoff, the Cowboys left Minnesota with an efficient 20 to 12 victory. In high formation, they get to Thomas Lane to the 10, to the 5, Thomas scores for the Cowboys! Thomas 13 and a half yards for a touchdown! In the championship game, Lilly, Starback, and Thomas performed at their peak when it mattered most. It was a big win, but the mission hadn't been accomplished. Even though we had taken a step, we still had that tag of Dallas can't win the big game. And the only way to get the monkey off our back was to win it all. The Cowboys never had trouble getting to the big games. Winning them was always the problem. In Super Bowl VI, they faced an up-and-coming team, the Miami Dolphins. I think their main catalyst in the defense is their linebacker, uh, Bonacani's all over the field. And I think this is probably one reason why they've done so well. They're obviously a good defensive team and they wouldn't be where they are. Uh, our, our basic thought is naturally we have to you know, contain the running game, the great running game of the Dallas Cowboys. They have Calvin Hill and Dwayne Thomas and, and Walt Garrison. And uh, anytime you have three you know, great running backs like that and a lot of publicity is not given to Walt Garrison because of the Dwayne Thomas and Calvin Hill, then you, know, you, you have to expect that they're going to come out and just try to establish their running game against us. The Miami Dolphins defense was built on speed and pursuit, and those traits were personified by Nick Bonacanti, their middle linebacker. The Cowboys' strategy was to take his best assets and convert them into liabilities. He's tough, he's strong, he's got great recognition and great lateral movement. He'll really go after the play. Therefore, we have to control him. Tom was always talking about Nick Bonacani, Nick Bonacani, Nick Bonacani. Nick, uh, oh, man, Look, I was, I was, this white boy can't be that great. Yeah. <laughs> 
The film work paid off. Dwayne Thomas led the Cowboys with 95 yards rushing. As a team, they piled up a record 252 yards on the ground. The Cowboys disguised their runs and had Bonaconte, number 85, going the wrong way all day. The ball would start this way, the defense would start pursuing, and then the ball carrier would cut back and our offensive linemen would literally shove their linemen the wrong way. It was just incredible to watch how, how really a game plan could come together. At the three, pitch out of Thomas, Green cuts inside the five to the five. Dallas moved the ball effortlessly and gave ground reluctantly. Miami managed three points. For the only time in Super Bowl history, a team was held without a touchdown. For Bob Lilly, the cowboy who had endured the most hardship, it was his finest hour. Number 74 authored the game's signature play. I finally caught Bob because he made a turn my way. It was a huge, I mean, I cannot even begin to tell you. It was relief, like roll aids, or it spelled R-E-L-I-E-F. It just sent a message, and, and Bob was probably the most frustrated defensive guy the year before when we lost to Baltimore. I still see him throwing his helmet on the ground and bouncing up in the air, so he was, he was ready to play that football game. And Greasy back to throw we shut everybody down after that. Coach Shula, when they interviewed him, first thing he said, he said, that is as close as you're going to come to watching a perfect game, what Dallas did today. And I think I feel the same way. Early in the fourth quarter, the Cowboys had a three-touchdown lead. The final minutes were a coronation and a chance for reflection. A long time. A long time. A long time. Love it. I'm real proud of you. I was, I was crying for you. I was. So That's good. Well, yeah. Nothing we could say. I don't want to say anything because I've been there before. Congratulations. I've been arrested up. Way to go, Walt. Way to go. Thank proud for you, Paul. Thank you. So proud for you. Thank you. What do you think, Coach? I think it's pretty nice. Congratulations. I'm really happy. For the Cowboys and their fans, the final seconds were counted down like a New Year's celebration. Indeed, the calendar had turned when the clock struck zero. It was finally next year, for the team known as next year's champs. We had to struggle for so long. I mean, 11 years of my life, I struggled with all my teammates, and we finally won it, and it was just like being free. I don't know, you know, I mean, I've never felt that way before, that you, you just felt like you could pretty near fly. It's a sense of accomplishment that that can't like I haven't had anything to replace it yet. I remember Coach Landry being lifted off the shoulders of the players coming off the field. I still have, have that picture of him smiling. They asked Walt Garrison, have you ever seen Coach Landry uh, smile? And he said, no, but I was only there nine years. But Walt was the, actually the guy lifting him off the field with that smile on his face. So uh, it just uh, it was kind of a magic time. You know, I didn't anticipate that kind of magic, especially when the, with the way the season started. It's the best feeling I've ever had as an athlete was in that locker room and the satisfaction of winning that game. We were four and three and all of a sudden we were Super Bowl champions. You think this now takes the uh, onus off that we can't win the big one anymore? I would think so. Well, if it is, I don't know how you spell it, I'll tell you that. 
Because that won't do it. That was a feeling that you can't buy. You couldn't spend a hundred million dollars and buy that feeling. No way. It made me feel wonderful, and it was so wonderful. I just cannot believe we finally did it. We finally did it. I think some of the guys that came along after we were winning championships, and they'll never really understand how important. Uh, that moment was in our lives and how much it how much it still means to us. Dwayne, how are you? All right, all right. My name's Tom Brookshire. Right. And it's nice to talk to you. And behind you is a fellow that used to run over me for a living, the great Jimmy Brown. How are you, Jim? Hi Tom, how are you? Dwayne, uh, you you do things in with speed, but you never hurry. Um, a lot like the great Jim Brown. Uh, you never hurry into a hole. You take your time, make a spin, yet you still outrun people. Uh, are you that fast? Are you that, that quick, would you say? Evidently. <laughs> Dwayne Thomas's one-word answer was fitting. It seemed nothing lasted very long when it came to the Cowboys' first championship. The next morning, I got up about... Uh, Six o'clock, I woke up because I was so excited, and uh, I went outside in the tent. We'd had a party the night before with Charlie Pride, and our families were all there, and, and the tent was gone, the chairs were gone, everything was gone except the garbage. And it dawned on me that that, that day was over. I mean, I said, you know, this is headlines today, and it's over. I mean, the biggest day of my whole life is gone. It's, it's gone. I don't know if it'll ever come back again. Sure didn't. At the next training camp, Dwayne Thomas was even more isolated and insubordinate than the previous year. You can never tell what he was going to be like in any given day. You might walk by him one day and he would say, you say hello to him and he would say hello to you. The next day he'd say, hey, leave me alone. Hey, don't talk to me. Before the start of the 1972 regular season, Thomas was traded to the San Diego Chargers. It was downhill, that whole training camp, and finally he had to go. He was a big part of our first Super Bowl, and uh, in 72, it just uh, it, it totally fell apart. Defensive tackle Bob Lilly and quarterback Roger Starback continued their legendary careers, and both ended up in the Cowboys' Ring of Honor and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In San Diego, Dwayne Thomas continued to self-destruct. He played his last NFL game in 1974 at the age of 27. You know, I just can't tell people enough how good he was and how much I hated to see a person kind of waste a Hall of Fame career. I've told him that every time I've ever seen him. I said, I, yeah, I fully expected you to be the next Jim Brown, and I did. Dwayne Thomas was always a crisis waiting to happen. But in 1971, he was also a champion. When it comes to America's team, controversy and success go hand in hand. Every Super Bowl Dallas has won, every last one, has been controversy. The controversy was with Dwayne Thomas. The controversy was with Thomas Henderson. The controversy was with what? Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jump. And they won. And Switzer. But the thing is, the Dallas has never won without controversy. Yeah, different personalities gyrate differently. But the thing is, the one thing I can say, we won.